Okay, what do we say? What is a fractal? What's a fractal? Very good. That is a simple thing that maybe has slipped past you. Okay, looking at the test, kind of feel like it has slipped past the stuff. Okay, so a graph is uh, made of, well, an infinite. What is a graph? An infinite. Number of points. Infinite number of points. Uh, and, and that, the, all of those points, uh, is a way of representing a most often a function that's you know an equation. So you might have an equation like y equals three x plus two. We put in something for x, and we get something out for y. That x and that y that we put in, we've got out. Plot that point, all right? That's one teeny tiny part of that graph. There's an infinite number of parts of that graph, all of these points. Let me plug in another x, and we get another y, and we have another point, and we get a third point, and a fourth point, and a fifth point, and so on. Uh, and if we have no idea what the graph looks like, we plot enough of these points, it starts to look like something, and it kind of fill in in between, and then make guesses what happens way out to the right, way out to the left. Where are all of those other points going to wind up going? Okay, so it also could be like the picture form. What is a graph? The picture form of a function. We deal with functions and equations a lot in algebra. I think that that's not surprising. Okay, so what is a function? Let's go over this again. What is a function? Input output thing, exactly. It's something that you put an input into, you get an output out of, that's it. Vending machines, right? We talked about vending machines, and gas pumps, and all kinds of things. And this equation, this guy over here, is a function. You put something into it, usually into x, but into y if you want. That's just kind of a, a backwards way of, of doing what we normally do. The conventional way is plug something in here for x, get something out for y. Function. Okay? So that leads into this question. What does each point represent? Yeah. A piece of data. Okay. Yeah. Can you expand on that a little bit with the data, where the data comes from? Like it will represent whatever you're trying to show, mm -hmm. like a comparison, like yeah. a year and however long, like however many years it took and how far you went or what. Okay, yeah. So you're, are you thinking maybe of like somebody went out with a clipboard and a piece of paper and collected some data, and then we put it on a graph. And each point can represent how far mm -hmm. and how long. Sure, so a lot of graphs are this much time went by and this distance was obtained somehow, right? Just for some reason. How tall somebody is or how far somebody went. So yeah, a, a particular kind of graph is of data. Yeah, I'm gonna, but we're talking about functions, not just data. Not, and data is just kind of messy is the point. It's kind of messy. It's a bit random, right? Not everybody who is five years old is 3.2 feet tall, right? Not, it doesn't fit everybody. So data from the real world, real world is a little messy, but we're talking about functions, like perfect mathematical functions they're nice and smooth, predictable, but not very random. No, not random at all. The exact opposite of random. Right? So then, if we're talking about perfect mathematical functions, what exactly does each point represent? Remember what we just said the function was? Right? Does it represent an output? An output, and also, how do we get that output? The input. The input. Yes, we input something, we get something out, it becomes a point. The point becomes a representation of the input, comma, output. Okay? So, an input, output, pair. That point represents the number that we put in and the number we got out. If it's 5, comma, 3, we put in 5 and got out 3. If it's negative 2, comma, 7, we put in negative 2 and got out 7. And the way we find that out is 
number in there for x, <coughs> find y. Now we know where that point should go. We know what the input and output are. All right. And now I come to this question. Something that you should keep in mind as we graph all graphs. Because as we talk about what's the behavior of this graph, and where is this function, and what's this function, what's the value of this function, and where is this function going, and all of these things that probably don't sound like they're making a lot of sense, they make more sense when you remember this. I don't know what the graph looks like. Can I start to understand what it looks like? Hmm? Like, I can have five points, and it's still, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure what this, the graph of this thing is supposed to look like, what the shape of this graph is supposed to be. So I plug something in, and I get something out, and I get another point, and I get another point, and another point, and I just get as many points that it takes so that I get a good, big picture of what this graph looks like at least from here to here and here to here, right, in this window. The graphs go on forever, right? They don't just exist right here near the origin. They exist everywhere, all over the place, OK? Um, so uh, put in more inputs. test as I was looking like a good number of you recognize that something needs to go into the function and it kind of broke down a little bit at that point. Like, a little trouble with the order of operations. Um, so try and get some more practice in that area. Um, but yeah, plugged in points, plugged in things for x. Tried to get y, but kind of fell short a little bit. But the thing we're going to do today is start with the easiest function, like no x squares, just x's, times some numbers, maybe fractions. Well, there's going to be quite a few fractions in there. Um, and that's it. We start with the easiest functions. They're called linear functions, very basic, as easy as it gets. Other than a single point somewhere in space, a line would be the next easiest thing to draw right? and figure out where it is and where it goes and where all the points belong. This is, this is going to be useful information, useful way to look at graphs for all time. As long as you deal with graphs that come from functions like this, this is going to be useful. So don't let it slip from your grasp. Function? Is it not a function? Yes, it is a function. Okay. Let's start off simple. I haven't really gotten into uh, solving equations, so it won't be too complicated. So, figure out what the graph of this function looks like. We just went over what a function is, right? Or what a graph is. It's all the points. What do we need? We need some points. How do we find points? Input and output. Put in something, get out something. So do that a few times and start plotting those points until you feel like you know what the graph is looking like and then go ahead and fill in all the other trillions of points by connecting them and extending it however you think it looks. Okay. So that's your job right now. So you're just throwing random numbers? Yep, random number, any number you, you want to. The only thing that would stop you from putting a number in there would be that uh, for some reason it's impossible to plug into this function, which isn't the case in this one. I can show you one later that you can't plug certain numbers into. Um, and maybe you don't want to plug numbers in that make your life harder, right? So kind of be smart about what you plug in there. But other than that, yeah, anything, anything you want. OK. Um, I see some people doing things like this, plug in a 1 and 2. And that equals 3, and that's exactly what it needs to do. And that absolutely works. Okay, so uh, if we were keeping track of that, we could do uh, x is 2, y is 1. All right, we've got some input and output there. We could do uh, the other way around. 2 plus 1 equals 3. Okay, 
second, so uh, y is 2 and x is 1. But even that, like you don't have to just think in your head of numbers that add up to 3. It could be anything. So I can just choose any number, plug it in for, in this case, x or y. Like these are, these are equally easy things to plug in. Uh, like I can choose 7 for x plus y equals 3. But I just need to figure out what y is. Right? Well, we solve this equation, right? This is some, we did some basic equation solving in free algebra. We subtract seven on both sides. Y equals negative four. Four. Well, how did we get that? We put in seven for x. Okay, there's some more points. So we come over here. We're going to graph. All right, two, one, two, one, or one. Seven, negative four, three, four, five, six, seven for the input. One, two, three, four in the negative direction. Seven, negative four. I kind of feel like I don't know what this graph looks like. I kind of get an idea here, but I want to see when I come over here. Is it going to curve? Is it going to keep going this way? I just need to choose an input that's over there. Over here would be negative x's, like maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, negative seven. So y plus negative 7 is 3, add 7, add 7, y equals 10. So 10, 10, 10, 10. This seems to just keep going up. So now we start to get an idea. And what, where do you think, if, if I were to plug in negative 3, for instance, do you think I get a point down here? Uh, could you, but do you think that that's what you would guess? Would that be your guess? That the point would wind up down here somewhere? Why not? Silas? Because it doesn't um, make sense with the other points. Yeah, the other points, they look like they're going boop, 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 up that way. Why would one just drop down ran randomly down here? <laughs> Maybe it happens, but it certainly would seem strange yeah, the points are going along here, and then come down here, and then jump back up there. I don't think so. That's not what I think. I, if I'm not sure, I could plug in negative 3 for x, find out, see if it happens. But it turns out, no, it is going to be somewhere along there. I think it's going to be somewhere like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's find out. Let's plug in negative 3 for x. y <laughs> plus negative 3 equals 3. Add three of both sides, y equals six. Yeah. So this should come out as six. My graph was perfect and the scale was perfect and I was uh, perfect in every way. Then this graph would look like a perfectly straight line. But with all these points, it's starting to look like if I were to plot more points and more points and more points and more points, and it would all start to meld and melt together, and the, the space in between them would be so small that I couldn't even see it anymore, and I would have what looks like a line. And that's what's happening here. So what am I doing now? I'm plotting an infinite number of points. I just plotted an infinite number of points by drawing one continuous, not broken up line. And I'm gonna guess that even beyond in between these points, if I were to keep going in the x direction this way, I would keep getting y's that are steadily down, 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 down. And in this direction, if I kept going in, uh, in the negative direction with my x's, I would get y's that are bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in a pattern that would continue to make a line. It wouldn't be curvy at all. Okay. Let's try again. This guy right here. Points, plot those points, until so you have so many points that the shape that the, all of the infinite number of points could make seems pretty clear. I'm just going to finish it up. Because for this one, again, we can guess at an x and a y that will work together and add up to 9. So let's think of it like a function. A function is we put something in, we get something out. Right? So let's plug in 1. For x, y equals 9. So 3 plus 
y equals 9, so 3 on both sides. Input in and out. Input one, get out six. So now I want to show you. Well, what what shape did this graph wind up being? Strip the line. Yeah. And and actually anything that looks like a number times x plus a number times y equals some other number. If it looks like that. And I can just go ahead and tell you it will be a line when you graph it. That's why it's called a linear function. And linear functions can look lots of different ways. They can rewrite these, put the x's and y's in different places, and they can look all sorts of different ways. Okay? This is one way. An equation, like a function, an equation function, that will make a line when you graph it, that's one way it can look. Okay. So we'll just start with that assumption. Just kind of give you that few pieces of information. If I know it's going to be a line, then how many points do I need to find? How many? Two. Two. Only two. I only need two. One's not enough, but two will tell me exactly where the line should be. Three, more than I need. Four, definitely way more than I need. I only really need two if I know the graph is a line. If I know all the points will form a line. So now it's just kind of a game. How can I find points very, very quickly? What can I put in for x? Anything I want? Anything I want. I will choose 0. I think it would be pretty easy to figure out what y is if x is 0. Because then that x term is not there. And what's left is y equals 9. So I know right away y is equal to 9. But those two points alone would be enough. Okay? If I didn't happen to have that 1, 6 point, I could do the same thing with y. I could put a 0 in for y. And then I would get 3x equals 9, divide by 3 on both sides, and x is 3. Now I have three points. I would say that these two are the easiest ones to find because multiplying by 0 is such an easy thing to do. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 3, comma, 0. See if one comma six kind of lands on that line. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll kind of lie a little bit, then the graph isn't perfect. My marks aren't exactly right, but you can see that it's believable that if, if this was a perfect graph, then yes, it would work out just like it's supposed to. And one six would be on the line. So if our equation looks like that, and we are told that it's going to be a line for sure, and we only need two points, well, what do you think is the easiest way to find the two points? Is that e zero? Use zero. Use zero for x, figure out y. Use zero for y, figure out x. Easy, two points, very, very simple. What if these points have special names? Do you remember them from any graphing experience? You know what that was called? That would be point E. So why is this point B and this isn't point B? It's got a more special name. Yeah? This is something like line segment or something? <coughs> no, it's not line segment. This point isn't a line, right? This point is a point. So it's this oh, point. Oh, I'm going to do No. A function is like the thing that, that takes inputs and turns them into outputs. Don't you just write 0, 0, 0? That is uh, the location of the point. But this point, right, on this axis, when our graph touches that axis, it has a special name for that particular. This whole thing's the y-axis, but that, that, that is the name. It does have something to do with y, the y-intercept. All right, remember y-intercept? The word intercept just means cross paths, really. Right? So when the path of the line, or whatever graph it is, crosses the path of the y-intercept, you got a y-intercept. Or sorry, the y-axis, and you got a y-intercept. So what do you think about that? What's that called? X-intercept, of course. This is why we might call this graphing with intercepts. This is called, it should be called intercept form. And maybe in some books it is, but. 
uh, it's called something called the standard form. All these forms of the equations have different names and they're all kind of weird, but if it's in quote standard form, just like this, number times x plus number times y equals some other number, plug in zero for x and zero for y, you got yourself a couple of points. You know it's gonna be a line, so then you just can connect those two with a line. But here's something important. Not every graph is a line. In fact, if we were to work it out in percentages, the percentage of graphs that are lines is very small, very, very small. Okay. Most of them, if you just randomly throw some numbers and operations together, you get some kind of a curve. Okay. Not a straight line. Okay, let's work out this uh, intercepts thing. Maybe one more time. Thanks. Like I said a minute ago, graphing lines, you only need two points, so it's like a game. A game of finding two points. You want to find two points that are difficult to figure out, and you want to find two points that are easy to figure out. <coughs> so let's play something in for x. What would be the easiest thing to plug in for x? Zero. Zero. Always when we're multiplying by x, zero would be really easy. High school teachers, please release. The girls' volleyball team. High school teachers, please release the girls' volleyball team. Thank you. All right. Seth. You need to come clean. Tell them you're a bully. That's why you got it. Okay. So if we put in zero for x, three y equals twelve is left. Clearly, y is four. Good luck. Good luck. Goodbye. Okay. And another thing that would be really easy to do is plug in 0 again, but for y, and then figure out what x would be. So then 2x equals 12, and x equals 6. Conveniently, know that this is going to be a line if it's number times x plus number times y equals number. So we just need to find two points. Given the, the task of graphing a line, uh, we're going to just play the game of find two points that are very easy to find. Well, there you go. There's, there's that version of it. Click zero in for both things. Um, <coughs> were to plot some points and graph this guy, would it be a line? I'm not sure. It doesn't look like the other equations just looked today. Or does it? It doesn't. It doesn't look like the other equations we just did. Well, now we're to, you know, the answer to question three at the beginning, that first screen that we looked at. I don't know what the graph looks like. Plot some points. Let's pick some easy things to plug in. But before we start plugging things in, I want to talk to you about uh, a math word. Math word is domain. Have you guys ever heard the word domain before in math? No, I really can't remember. Uh, okay, well, here's what domain is. I'm just going to say, what's this saying? Can you read it to me, Seth? Um, I think it means x is greater than zero. Almost all of that is correct. Well, all of that's correct, and more could be correct. X is greater than. So if x is 0, or if x is 1, or if x is uh, half, or x is positive 0 0.0001, like all these are value or uh, valid values of x. Okay, those all count. So what about negative 5? Is that OK? Well, no, because x is negative 5 is not greater than 0. It's not equal to 0. So that's out. So where we used to say, like, well, you can plug anything in for x. I'm forcing you, basically, to not plug in any negative numbers. But all, all the other numbers are fine. You can plug in anything you want. 
So the word domain means the set of all the inputs. X is normally the input. So whatever you can plug in for X, that's the domain. Let me just write that down here. Domain set of all inputs. Usually for most functions, the domain is anything you want. Right? All of the numbers, all real numbers. Now in this case, is that is that true? Am I allowing you to put any number you want into this function? No. No. So I am changing the domain. I am limiting it. I'm restricting it. Restricting the domain. So here I am restricting. Restricting the domain. And changing what values you can plug in. Changing the x values. So now that I've changed that and I've said we can only basically use positive numbers, what would be something easy to plug in for zero? One, one. For x. One, what would be easy, easier still to plug in for x? Zero. Zero, because it is allowed. It can be equal to zero. Um, how about two? That's not so hard. Three. Kind of things like that are fractions. Those are pretty easy. Because I just have to multiply them by two. Easy, easy stuff. Let's do zero. If I do two times zero plus three, I'm going to wind up with three. Two times one plus three, that's going to be five. Two times two plus four plus three is going to be seven. Two times three is six plus three is going to be nine. Notice this pattern. We kind of have to switch these in our heads. I go from zero to one, and my y goes from three to five. Then I go from 1 to 2 on the x. Let's look at it on the graph. You can see this pattern on the graph. 0 gives me 3. I move over to 1, and I get a 5. I move over to 2, I move over one more, I go up to 7. I move over to 3, that gets me at 9 for y. You think that pattern is going to continue exactly just like that? Over one, and add two more. Move to the next x, move up two more. Yeah, because all I'm doing is I'm plugging a number in here and multiplying it by two. If I plug in the next x, it's just going to be the next multiple of two. That's going to be two more than the last number I got. It's just a pattern. Every time I move over one, I move up two. Over one, up two. Over one. Anybody have a name for that? That pattern? Don't you go over and up, up and over? Yes? Rise over run. Rise over run. This is called the rise because it's vertical. Rising is vertical. Run, that's horizontal. You usually run on a horizontal uh, ground. And there's a word for the rise over the run. It starts with an S. That's slope. Remember slope? Yeah. Okay, you've heard of slope before. Cool. So we have the slope of the line. We notice that every time we put in the next x value, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, we just get the next multiple of 2, because we multiply by 2. So we just keep moving in the y direction. We keep moving up 2. Over 1, up 2. Up 2, over 1. It's all the same thing. Should I continue my line this way? Sure. Sure? There's no reason I shouldn't do that? No, there's no negatives. No negatives, right? Is this in the negative x's territory? Mm -hmm. I just said don't do that, right? Uh, so, no, I shouldn't do that. I should get rid of that. The graph will only go from x is 0 to x is whatever, infinity. It goes on forever in the positive direction. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the domain. The domain is x can be greater than or equal to zero. If the domain is all the inputs, what would you guess the range might be? Domain 
is set of all the inputs, range. The actual answer, yes? Uh, would be all the outputs. Yes, all the outputs. Set of all outputs. Where do we get outputs from? Plugging them in. Okay, that's how we find them. We plug things in for x and we get them out for y. y right? The things for y would tell us what the outputs can be. Well, we've got a nice little graph here. We have gone as like far left for x as we possibly can go. Right? So if we've done that, if we've, if we've kind of pushed the limits of what the domain is, that should tell us something about the range. What kind of outputs can I get from this function? Positive. Are there any positive numbers that I'm not getting out of this function? Take a look at the graph. You're not getting four? Well, not, by not specifically, but by looking at the graph, where's 4? It's right here. Mm -hmm. Is there an x value that will give me 4? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important to be able to decipher from the graph. Mm -hmm. to, that you quickly say, oh, yeah, that's good. It's a good sign. Because you see that there is a graph at y equals 4, and so I'm going to guess that x is 1 half will give me 4. It seems like that's what we are there any y values that we are not getting? How about some y values down here? Any of these y values? Are we reaching any of these? Is there anything we can plug in for x that's going to give us a negative number? There is not. No. All right, how about crossing some other y values off the list, some other outputs off the list that we're not going to be able to get? Two. Two? Let's look. One, two. There is no graph at two, right? So is 2 an output? No. It must not be because what? where do I find outputs? On the graph. Mm -hmm. The graph does not exist at 2. <coughs> so 2 is off the list. 2 is not part of the range. What else is not part of the range? 1. 1. How about 1 and a half? Everything, everything between 1 and 2. How about everything between 0 and 1? How about all the negative numbers? Okay, we're starting to see it. What values of y can you get? can get. 3 and above. 3 and above. How do we say that with mass symbols? <laughs> How do we say it with x? Aiden? Oh, uh, you could do like x greater or equal to 3. Greater than or equal to 3, but it's 1. Yeah. There you go. You ready? OK. Exactly. The range we can see by the graph, and the fact that zero is the smallest x we can possibly put in, so we must get like the limit of what y can be, and then all the y values just keep getting bigger from there. From three, equal to three and up, that's what y can be, if x can only be equal to or greater than zero. So if you're asked to find the domain of the range, it's just saying, look at the x's, what kind of x's can you put in? All of them, only some things, Everything except for one value. Okay, we're not going to graph this, but I'm going to talk to you about this function just real quick. What's the domain of this function? What things can you put in for x? Yeah? Um, anything. Uh, never mind. I, I lost my train of thought. All right, Seth, did you pick it up? Uh, wait, are we talking about. Talking about this function, we're talking about what can x be? What is the domain, right? Domain is what x can be. What about 2? Can x be 2? Sure. Yeah. What, is that, what does that make y? 1 half. Is that wrong? No, there's nothing wrong with that. So x can be 1 half, but it can be a lot of things, right? So we've got to narrow it down and express it kind of in a short form. 2 can be 3, 4, negative 5, negative 12. It has to be a positive. It can't be negative. Why can't it be negative? Because well, I might cancel out the 1, so it's like a negative 3. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. If I put negative 3 there, it'll just be negative 1 third. That's a number. Right? Yeah. That's a valid output. Cannot be 0? Cannot be 0. But everything else is fine, because what can I divide 1 by? Anything except for 0. Cannot be 0. OK. 
Hey, it cannot be zero, right? Uh, so that is a domain doesn't, you know, it's restricted. It doesn't uh, allow all values of x. Here's a tricky, a little bit trickier question. What about y? What can y be? Or what can y not be? Yeah? Y can't be zero either. Why not? Because you can't get one over something with like nothing there. Like if I have like zero slices of pizza, yeah. I can't create one slice out of five pieces from no pizza. So let, let's say I have a one pizza, mm -hmm. and I'm going to divide it into pieces. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way to divide it so that I'm with, left with nothing? No. I can't divide a pizza up into so many pieces that uh, each piece is nothing. Mm -hmm. I can slice it pretty small, right? So that each piece is like 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 1. It would be very small, but I can't ever get to 0. Can I get very big numbers? How do I get big numbers? How am I going to get like, how do I get this to be 5? What would I put in for x to get 5? 5? So 1 divided by 5 is 5. 1 divided by 5 is 5. Never mind. Sorry. 1 divided by 5 is 1 fifth, yeah. <laughs> but 1 divided by something can be 5. What is that thing that we can divide by and get 5? Be 0.25? Well, we're getting close. If we divide by 0.25, well, that's 1 over 1 fourth, right? Well, this is just a fraction divided by a fraction, right? This is like 1 over 1. 1 over 1 divided by 1 over 4 multiplied by the reciprocal of the denominator. 1 over 1 times 4 over 1. So we got 4. We didn't get 5, but we did get 4. Well, it would be 0.20. 0.2, yeah, that would work, because that's 1 fifth. 1 divided by 1 fifth would be 5. So we can get big numbers, right? Can I get a million? Sure, 1 over a million. Can I have 1 over 1 over a million? We get a million. Whatever, whatever we want. So it seems like, and it's true, the only thing y cannot be is 0. There's just no way to take 1 divided by something and wind up getting 0. Outputs, see what the shape of the graph starts to look like, and well, then finish all the trillions of dots by drawing whatever shape it looks like it's taken. Okay, like I said, anything you want to plug in for x, you can. Uh, see this out there, 3 fourths times 2, let's do 2 over 1, makes it a little bit easier. Uh, 3 times 2, 6, 4, how about 3 over 2, right? These both, these have a factor of 2. Well, now what do we need in order to add two fractions together? Common denominator. Common denominator. So I'll make this 2 over 1, multiply this by 2 over 2, and get 3 halves plus 4 halves equals 7 halves. I did it. x, y, x was 2, y is 7 halves. Alright, not too bad. Too difficult, right? Is there an easier something? Four for x. Let's see. And is promising me that four will be easier. Okay, well I'll multiply them together just like I did over here. I get uh, twelve over four plus two. Why is that any easier? So now I don't have a fraction. The order could be a fraction of like over one, but certainly easier to do 3 plus 2 than 3 halves plus 2. See where that is? That's what's going on there. Yeah, that's a great idea. That gives us 5. That was really easy. 
Is this correct? Absolutely, it's correct. This is correct, and it has the added benefit of being a little easier. Right? Anything else that's also easy? Tyler? Zero. Zero. That sounds really easy. Three fourths times nothing leaves me with nothing plus two. It's just two. Zero comma two is another point that I can plot. How many points can I find? Two for the least. For the least, how many can I find? Infinity. An infinite number. So here are some points, 0 for x, 2 for y. I put in 0 for x, I get 2 for y. 4 for x, 5 for y. And I get 2 and 7 eighths, so 2, or 7 and halves. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Halves. Let's keep it going. What's another easy thing to plug in for x? 16, why does 16 work so well? Because it's a factor of 4. 4 is a factor of 16. 16 will work. What else will work? 8. And now with this, I have to read your lips. 8. 1. 1. Well, if we do 1, it's not too hard. 1 times 3 fourths is 3 fourths. But then again, what do I have to find? Mm -hmm. I mean, we shouldn't be afraid to do it, but things, right? We could do one. But when we do one, if we plug one in there, we're going to get what? You're going to have a fraction here. And we're going to have to kind of guess where it is. And the smaller, like the bigger the denominator, the smaller the piece, and the harder it is to guess it when they graph it, right? So not bad, not wrong, but not as easy as some other things. What about in a negative direction? Could you do things in a negative direction? The negative four be easy? Sounds like a question. Let's answer it by doing some math. Three fourths times negative four. What's a positive term of the negative? Negative. It's a negative. Okay. Negative twelve over four plus two. Well, that's just negative three plus two. That's negative one. So I can't plug in negative four. It does cancel the denominator, and we do get negative one. Do you think about negative 8, negative 12, negative 16, negative 40? What about negative 2? Negative 2. Let's see what happens when we do negative 2. Negative 2 over 1. Negative times positive is negative. We get 6 over 4. That simplifies to 3 halves. Negative 3 halves plus 2 plus 4 halves. So we get. One half, negative two, comma one half. But then again, we have this fraction that we have to plot, and then it becomes kind of a guess as to where exactly is one. Okay. It would be much easier to be accurate if it's right on the grid line, right? Right there. So let's see, you got negative four, negative one, negative uh, two, one half. On plotting points. What if I, yeah? Um, I know it's a fraction, but would four thirds, like four over three, work too? Or? Oh, that's pretty clever too. Y equals three fourths times four thirds plus two. Well, what's, well, I get 12 over 12, right? That's just one. One plus two is three. Part of it is I also have to graph four thirds as my x. So my y came out as a as a whole number, but then my x is four thirds. So it's like one, two, three, four thirds, and three. If my marks were a little better, it would be closer to what it should actually look like. So whatever we want, but it turns out the easiest ones are zero, right? Number one, ranked number one for easiness. And what would be easy after that? 
We did one. One came out to be a fraction. We, what I mean by easy is, if we can not have fractions, it's certainly easier, right? So what happens to, like, what, what do we plug in for x so that we don't have to work with fractions? 4, 8. 4, 8. What are these numbers called? Multiples. Multiples of 4, even more specifically. They are multiples of 2, but even more specifically 4. Anything that is a multiple of 4 will get canceled by 4, right? Which really means it's going to cancel the denominator of 4 and no more denominator. Or if you think of it as a denominator, it's a denominator of one, which is super easy. And all these points, and all the trillions of points in between them, and all the trillions of points to the left and to the right. What's the domain of this function? What the domain is defined by? That's the slope. Domain. Set of all inputs. Which which variable is the input variable? X is the input variable. X is the input variable. What can we put in for X is the question. That's what the domain is asking. What's that? Anything. Anything. Any real number. Yeah. Right? I can write all real numbers. <coughs> Which we can use this symbol. That's an R with two vertical things. Uh, that means all real numbers. How about the range? Can I get zero out of this function? Can y be zero? Okay. Well, let's take a look at the graph. Y is zero oh, no. all along here, right? Wow. Oh, look, there's a graph where the y is 0. All right, we got to just look across here. y is uh, 5. Can y be 5? No. Well, oh, yes, it can. Can y be negative 7? Yes. There is a graph over there at negative 7 for y. All right. I can get anything out of the function I want. I might have to put in some weird fraction or decimal or something, but I can get anything for y. It is conceivable. So, it's the same. For the range, y can be anything. I can get any y, I just have to pick the right x. And the same with x, x can be anything. And then y will just be whatever it is. I want you to remember this, you know, with the question of what should I plug in for x. Let's do this again. Pick our x's wisely, yes? Five. Five for x, I like that idea. X is five. Can anybody beat the easiness of five with another number? Something easier to plug in than five. It's always just the easy, what's that? Yeah. Zero, always zero. It's gonna be a really easy thing to plug into a function because anytime you're multiplying by x and you plug in zero for that, it's zero in that place. If I multiply by zero here, I don't even need to write this down, right? Zero. What's left? Zero. It's like zero minus six. Right? I don't even have to write it down to be sure that I'm correct. That's got to be the easiest. Let me go ahead and write it down with five. But it is a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, negative three fifths times five over one. Six. Cross cancel when I'm multiplying. Negative three minus six. So I'm just going to take negative six, right? Subtract 3. Subtract 3, so negative 9. How about something in the negative direction that's also very easy? Negative 5, yeah. So uh, I'm just going to reuse this. I'm going to recycle this here. So negative there. What's the difference here? What's, what's the difference going to be here? I'm going to take a negative. Positive. So if I go in the negative direction, I put in a negative 5, I'm just going to add 3. Negative 6. So I'm going to get negative 3. It would also be an easy thing to plug in for x. 10. 10. Something else? 15. 
15. Something else in the negative direction. Negative 15. Negative 15. Negative what else? 20, negative, 10. negative 10. So any number that has 5 as a factor, or any number that is a multiple of 5. Okay. See if we can start to do this kind of quickly. If we do, uh, we're just going to put 5 again down here, negative 9, and then 10, and 15, and then 20. <coughs> Any multiple of 5 is going to be just the cakewalk. So let's put in 10. So we got negative 3 fifths times 10 to 1 minus 6. Cancel the 5, cross cancel, right? We're all familiar with the cross canceling. We get 2 times negative 3, that's going to be negative 6 minus 6. Right? So that's just going to be negative 6 minus 6 is negative 12. Just recycle it, change it from 10 to 15. 15 over 1. What's the difference? Well, it still is going to cancel that 15, but we're going to be left with 3. 3. Still have at least 10 minutes. I need to zip. I need to zip. Okay. Uh, so what's that going to be? That's going to be 3 times negative 3. It was 1 times negative 3, that was 2 times negative 3. Now we're at 3 times negative 3. We're at negative 9. Negative 6 minus 9. Negative 15, right? From negative 6 to negative 9, to negative 12 to negative 15. If we go over another 5 to 20, what do you think the next y will be? Negative 18. Okay. Down 3, 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 down 3. Every time we move over to the next multiple of 5, we just move down another 3 on the y axis, the y direction, the vertical direction. Bunch of points here. 0, negative 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, yeah, 5, negative 9, 10, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, negative 12, 15, negative 15, 15, negative 15. Go. We can go the other direction. Uh, negative five, negative three. So if I move to the left, a multiple of five, left five, then I start coming up three, right? Because I'm subtracting a negative three. So up three from there. There we go. There's another point. And if you graph all the trillions and billions and an infinite number of points, the shape of this graph will start to look like a what? A line. In fact, it's already starting to look like a line. If I were to graph all the ones in between, I would just get points like this, and I get points like this, and then we kept going and just keep getting points just like this. We just keep following that pattern, right? That pattern called the slope. Move over five, move down three, move over five, move down three, move over five, down three, move to the left five, move up three. Yeah? What do we have? Five, uh, or two, five, negative nines? Well, I just wanted to move this guy down so we could see the pattern. Oh. Yeah, so I just kind of moved. So let me graph trillions of points now. I just graph trillions of points by drawing the shape. Yeah, Caitlin. Are we going to start doing where we start the y intercept by getting the 6 and then just. So you're observing that. Why am I doing all this? Right? Because it seems like anytime an equation looks like this, when I graph it, it'll look like what shape? A line. A line. Every time we've done this, whether it's 2x plus 5, or negative 3 fifths x minus 6, or whatever, times x plus something else, I just keep getting a line. And we're noticing it must always be that way if it's some number times x, because every time I put in the next uh, multiple of this guy, I move this much vertically. Right? You notice that pattern? Every time we move over this much, or horizontally, we move this much vertically. We could just, you know, imagine we get paid per graph. Every time we draw a new graph, we get some money. So we want to do this as fast as possible. So we just need to find two points. That's all you need for a line. The first point is easiest to do is on the y-axis, because that's when you plug in 0 over x. Right? I can save myself time. 
okay? But only after I understand what's going on, not just because I've been told to put this point in the y-axis and go up and over it, and I'm not really sure why I do that, okay? Uh, so if I'm plugging zero for x, what am I gonna get for y? Two, I can see that really fast. That's why I know that y-intercept is two so quickly. Now I just need one more point. Well, where do I wanna go on the x to make my life easier? What do I want to plug in for x? Seven. seven. I want to move to the right seven, right? When we do the slope, if you've learned the slope before, up and over, rise over, run, or run and then do the rise or whatever, it's always the rise over the run. Uh, then that's really all you're doing. You're just moving to the next x value. That is a simple operation to plug in for x. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't want to go to one or two or three, four, five or six because all of those are going to be fractions as my output. Seven is the next x value that will give me out an integer, right? Whole, whole number. So when I move over to seven, I'm going to put seven there. I'm going to wind up canceling sevens and get a negative three. Right? That's what's going to happen every time. Or if I move to fourteen, I'll get negative six. If I move to twenty-one, I get negative nine. I just keep moving down three, 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 three. So if I move over to seven, all I have to do is subtract three, and there's another point. And this pattern continues. This is enough. This is all I need to draw a line, right? Better continue this pattern and go to 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That would be the next x value that I don't get a fraction for my output. And it's just going to be three more down. There. Going exactly in that way. Every time you move over seven, you move down three more. So now that we understand what's going on, we plug in zero for x gives us the y-intercept. Real easy. We follow the slope pattern because we move over enough. We move over the amount of the denominator. That's the next x value that I'm going to get an output that's not a fraction. So we follow that pattern. We go over seven, down three, over seven, down three, down three. Over or if I go backwards, if I go into the negatives, back seven to negative seven, well, negative times negative will be positive, so in that direction I'll start moving up. Every time I go back an amount of seven, multiple of seven. So, if you had something like this, what would you do to really quick find two points? Put, put something in for x and y. What would be the easiest thing to plug in for x and y? Zero. Zero for x, figure out y. Zero for y, figure out x. Boom, two points really fast. All right. If you had something like this, what's that? Nine, plug in nine, right? That'll be really easy. What else? Zip. OK, I'm going to keep going. But also, we want to get that zero, right? We want to utilize the zero. Oh, zero. If we put in zero, no, negative 12, obviously. Right. Negative 12. And every time we go over nine, we'll move up five. Over nine, up five, over nine, up five, over nine, up five. We move over nine, let's say that's nine. And up five, that'll put us at negative seven. Just graphing lines, starting off easy linear functions, easiest functions that we can deal with. Right. We'll go with that. Homework coming out. Send it right now if you wanted.